Um, so my talk is going to have uh, three parts, and so I will um, briefly mention some of these works. They're kind of here just for, um, for reference, uh, and we'll talk a bit about some software tools that we've built, E3NN. Um, but the sections will be the following. So first, I'm going to give kind of a quick high-level overview, since we've had a lot of uh, equivariance discussions so far in this workshop. I'll be somewhat brief, but I at least wanted to highlight, you know, maybe some relevant works that folks might be interested in looking at. But because um, this is a more specialized audience, I'd actually like to take the opportunity to talk about um, kind of some other things about some emergent behavior of equivariant neural networks, which I usually don't get to talk about because it's a little bit more technically in the weeds. Um, also, I am currently in the process of designing a course on symmetry and its applications to machine learning, and so I'm shamelessly taking the opportunity to test out some of my material on you to hopefully, for those of you who've maybe, you know, heard about these irreducible representations, but they still seem kind of mysterious, I'm hoping to at least give yet another handle for, you know, either ways to explain it to your friends uh, or just get some, some more intuition. Uh, so let's, without further ado, let's get started on, first of all, um, you know, maybe what are some reasons why symmetry is useful. So uh, one of the reasons why we wish to imbue machine learning models with symmetry is that um, we tend to describe physical systems with coordinate systems. And coordinate systems are fundamentally arbitrary. There actually aren't these little arrow coordinate systems lying around in nature. Uh, but they sure are useful for describing physical systems to computers. So for example, if I have uh, these molecules over here and I have these two coordinate systems, coordinate system one and coordinate system two, uh, I'm describing the same system, but numerically, those numbers will be completely different. And in fact, we have the freedom in 3D space to basically choose our coordinate system however we like, and the description will transform predictably under the symmetries of 3D Euclidean space. So that would be 3D rotations, translations, and inversion. Now, the issue is that if I show you know, two lists of very different numbers to a traditional machine learning algorithm, <clears throat> it's not, it's not going to understand that these are really the same thing described differently. And this isn't just, you know, somewhat inconvenient. This can be really inconvenient, especially in 3D space. So if you have a machine learning model that is not built to handle symmetry, you need to teach it about symmetry. And whereas for 2D images, you can usually augment your data about tenfold if you want to make rotations of pictures of cats. Uh, about tenfold is, is usually sufficient. In 3D, this gets substantially worse. You roughly need about 500-fold augmentation. So more training time, uh, more model parameters to handle uh, the different poses that you're going to see. So that can get you know, a bit irritating, especially because you don't necessarily have a guarantee that it's actually learned that, for example, you know, this, all these versions of the cube are really the same object, just in a different orientation, versus with symmetry, you only need to train on one of these objects. So what we would like is we would like methods that can see that one and two are the same system, just described differently. So we would like symmetry built into our model. Now, there are two kind of approaches to this if you want to build symmetry into your model. There are invariant models, which basically say coordinate systems are really annoying. Let's just describe our system in a coordinate independent manner. And then there's equivariant models, which are saying coordinate systems are fine. We'll just be able to handle the coordinate system as part of the algorithm. And those you can just use your description of your system with any coordinate system you choose. And importantly, if you change your coordinate system, the outputs of your model are going to change predictably. So what's the catch? So interactions in equivariant models can be and tend to be more complex than in invariant counterparts. So if I have an invariant, something that doesn't change under rotation, and I have another invariant, something that also doesn't change under rotation, uh, the way I multiply them or combine them is just simple scalar multiplication. A number times a number is another number. Um, additionally, let's say I have something like a 3D vector that's equivariant, and I have a number. Since this is a scalar, all it can do is scale the vector. It can't change its direction. Um, so these are scalar interactions, and with this you could actually build an equivariant model, um, but it would only have scalar interactions. But there are additional higher order interactions. So for example, if I have two vectors, how can I interact two vectors? One way is I can compute its dot product. Another thing is I could do the cross product. Uh, and a more general operation is actually the outer product. So here's the outer product of two vectors. You can make a three by three matrix. 
And inside the outer product is actually hiding those other operations that I mentioned. So the trace is the dot product. The cross product is the anti-symmetric component of the matrix. And the symmetric traces component um, is yet another important aspect of this matrix. And it transforms in a different way. So what are additional reasons why you might wish to have symmetry in your model? And one of the big reasons is that it can make your data much more powerful. So if you consider the space of all learnable functions, that's a huge space. But if you're dealing with a physical system, typically the functions that you actually want to learn is much smaller. And the set of functions that are equivariant under Euclidean symmetry uh, is much smaller than the space of learnable functions. So by making your search space smaller, um, you're going to be better able to narrow into the functions that you actually wanted to learn, the functions that are actually compatible with the physics that you're trying to emulate, for example. So it really makes your data much more powerful. And I'll show some concrete examples of this data efficiency later. OK, so any symmetry equivariant method, whether it's a neural network, a kernel method, any sort of method whatsoever, basically has this property. It has symmetry built in such that it understands that a physical system described by different coordinate systems means the same thing. And it does that even without training. Now, it's not very useful if it's not trained, but this property holds even without training. Now, why this is important is that, let's say I wish to predict the Hamiltonian of this humble water molecule. So if I rotate this water molecule, this is a pretty simple rotation. I'm just rotating this object. But if I want to predict something like its molecular Hamiltonian, describing the interactions between electrons on different orbitals, the way that this object rotates is much more complicated. But even so, if you're working with an equivariant method, if you are able to learn this for kind of one pair of input outputs, you've automatically learned it for any rotation. So any rotation of this object creating any rotation of, of this object. So this means that if I wanted to predict forces, I rotate the molecule, I'll get rotated forces. Additionally, not only do we have global symmetry equivariance, so recognizing this entire object in any rotation, we also have any subgroup. So and similar patterns within the molecule will be recognized, even if they're appearing in another molecule in a different orientation. So you're basically like more readily able to extract useful patterns um, within your examples. And you're able to do this without kind of being biased by in what orientation they're being presented. But you'll still be sensitive to overall uh, relative orientation between patterns. OK, so let me pause there really quick to see if there's any questions that's come up so far. Great. OK, so a little bit more overview. Um, some of the things that we've done with E3NN so far. Uh, so we've, built the, we've used them to build scalable and efficient models of physical systems. And one thing that was really crucial in order to do this was to actually create software tools that made this practical. Because prototyping neural networks that have special mathematical operations, uh, it, can, it can get to be quite a lot of overhead if you don't have code to efficiently express the things you want to do. So this is why um, Mario and I started working together after we put out the tensor field networks with Patrick and folks. And Mario was on the. Uh, 3D steerable CNN's paper with Max and folks. Uh, and so we decided to join forces and, and make a library that could handle both voxels and, and point cloud data uh, and have 3D symmetry built in. And so we've worked a lot on this package. And um, it seems to be helpful not only for ourselves and our collaborators, but also other people. Uh, so if you're interested in building 3D equivariant models, this might be a helpful tool for you. And we also have a JAX version, which is actually um, it's, a, it's, I think, 44% more efficient, according to Mario and, and his benchmarking, uh, which is pretty cool, because that's just from the compiler. So some of the things that we've done so far is predicting properties of physical systems, like forces and energies, or kind of more exotic electronic structure properties, like uh, charge densities, so where electrons are at. Um, and they're Hamiltonians. Uh, and then also, uh, as Rafa showed earlier in, in his talks, we've also done kind of some partial generation encoding, decoding with this coarse graining work. 
And so I'm just going to quickly kind of flash these particular applications, and then we'll kind of dive more into some of these nitty gritty details about what makes these networks tick and their emergent properties. Um, so I think this was probably one of the big demonstration cases that equivariant networks could really be effective at um, problems that people cared about. So this is work with Boris Kaczynski's group at Harvard. And essentially, what we wanted to do here was see if we could use E3NNs to build molecular force fields or just atomistic force fields. So trained on DFT data, can these models learn to predict the same forces that you would predict at the level of DFT and scale those insights to larger systems? Um, so one benchmark that kind of came out was, uh, so DeepMD, which uh, we're not part of that team, but uh, they had this really great achievement where they got the Gordon Bell Prize, kind of the Nobel Prize of supercomputing, for scaling these machine learned ab initio molecular dynamics force fields to 100 million atoms. Huge, huge scientific and engineering feat. And this is what 100 million atoms looks like. Uh, a couple months, or like a, about a month later, we put out uh, an equip, which was able to demonstrate that we were about a thousand times more data efficient than the DeepMD model. So whereas for a water data set, DeepMD needed 100,000 examples, we only needed 100 to get better accuracy. Now, uh, being able to demonstrate that is only one part of the puzzle. As I said, scaling is quite a feat. And so later, um, Allegro came out out of Boris's group, and this is uh, not a message passing neural network. This actually has a fixed cutoff. But what that allowed them to do is that they could actually scale uh, these like and equip similar models to actually 100 million atoms and only on a moderate number of GPUs. This original demonstration was on 27,000 GPUs and this was on 100. Um, so a, a number of GPUs that is actually somewhat practical for a research group to, to feasibly use. And all these source codes are open source. So, and, and they've done an amazing job with Allegro and Equip making it possible for other people to pick up these codes and apply them to data sets that they care about. Um, Tess? Yep. I mean, what is your opinion on this, um, um, let's say, necessity to run the simulations, right? Beyond just getting the primes. Um, yeah. Especially if you have to cut off interactions, right? I mean, big systems are all about long range interactions. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, um, being able to handle long range interactions depending on the system, of course, super important. And so a different strategy is going to be needed than, um, you know, just having a fixed cutoff, whether that's sort of like learning some more global parameters. Um, that wasn't addressed specifically in this architecture. But I have no doubt that those things can be addressed, uh, but certainly not necessarily addressed by this specific architecture. But it at least shows that they can play ball with, with some of these larger systems. But I think actually, you know, the, the, the idea of local equivariant features, which um, have high angular momentum, actually pretty interesting because at long range, things are inosotropic. So mm -hmm. you need local inosotropic features in order to capture long range interactions. Yeah, I mean, certainly like multipole methods are very much kind of in this spirit. And, and certainly there's like strong ties between the math. Like certainly, you know, we were, you know, uh, people have known for a long time that spherical harmonic decompositions are very useful. So, yeah. Question? I was just going to add, I mean, isn't the, the point of like running something like this and very big because you have, you want to capture the defects at the extension of the defects, right? So you can't, yeah. if you want to, if you want to look at, you know, Brain boundary evolution or something like this. You can't do that in a small box. So you have exactly. to use millions and millions of atoms. Yeah, certainly being able to capture microstructure and just larger, larger scale things is super important. But right. yeah. But, but there's no uh, comparison to any experimental thing, right? So yeah. Still too small. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, there's cer there's certainly more more work to be done. By no means am I saying ah this is done. It's more of like these methods are at least they're competitive. Uh, and that they can, they're, they're up for the task. Obviously, they need to be modified to include things like long-range interactions. But, and there's also speed problems. Like, there are certainly other methods that are faster, um, but these seem to be the most accurate. But there is always an accuracy speed trade-off. So um, this is not certainly a one-size-fits-all. Thanks for the questions. Uh, next, again, I'm just going to go through these a little bit quickly. Um, 
one thing was we were uh, predicting charge densities with these models. And we were using this to sort of ask the question of whether we could predict sort of the nearsightedness of water. And the way we did this, and this, I don't know if Lucas is here, but Lucas is part of this work as well with Josh and, Josh and Lucas and Mario and myself. And basically, it was sort of trying to see, well, if I train a model seeing water clusters up to a certain size, how well can I predict the charge density of larger water molecules and kind of seeing where that convergence happens. And so this was sort of a, an unbiased way of sort of testing this uh, rather than trying to figure out some, some way to parameterize a quantum mechanical model to do this. So it was just more of a, a proof of concept of, of how would you go about answering this question using a neural network. Rafa already talked about this, but basically we're able to use an equivariant method to both coarsen and fine grain uh, molecules, as well as recover um, some of the distributions uh, of the fine grain structure, given that you're losing information in the coarsening. Uh, and so I, Chen is here, and so he was a very important part of this work. Uh, this was really fun. Uh, and then this is my proud parent moment. I've just started my research group, and so this is the kind of first paper coming out of my group. Uh, my uh, wonderful student, uh, Elon, has made an equivariant graph attention transformer that it's really a very um, kind of like elegant uh, version of basically trying to just take the elements of transformers in other areas and, and what's the minimal mapping to an equivariant graph version. And it turns out that it's, it's very effective, uh, very data efficient, and it's actually working competitively on the OC20 data set. Now, we're not at the top, because uh, our model is pretty small, um, but we've been doing some follow-up studies with Meta that shows that it's actually quite quite a good model. Uh, a bit expensive, because we need to still optimize our Tensor products a bit more for this application. Um, but it's doing quite well, um, to the point where we submitted a model. There was a competition at NeurIPS this year for the Open Catalysis Challenge. And we placed second. Uh, we combined equiformers with this really interesting model called Spherical Channel Network, um, which is a very interesting paper that's using sub-equivariant operations uh, that's very cool. And then additionally, our attention mechanism was picked up by Prescient, and they um, modified it for their equifold model, which was super cool. And this equifold model has basically the accuracy of alphafold, perhaps it's probably alphafold too, but uh, without using your multi-sequence alignment, and it's able to get the results um, much faster. So whereas something would take an hour, this one um, would just take a second. So it's, it's very cool to see that these mechanisms are being picked up and are used in other settings. I'm certainly not <laughs> an expert at all in these areas, so um, I won't be able to answer any questions about their work, but we were very excited to see that our attention mechanism was useful there. Um, okay, so that's kind of an overview of just some of the things we've been up to. Um, and then just one more point for this last point in this section is indeed we are seeing that equivariant models seem to be more data efficient than invariant models even when you're predicting invariance like energy. And the way that we measure this generally is that we make this plot. We take the log of the error and the log of the number of training examples. Uh, and we basically end up seeing a power law, so we see a line. And what we notice is that the slope, so the rate at which um, the model is learning, is much steeper than for an invariant model. And this, the offsets are going to be architecture and task specific, but the um, comparing the different slopes, we, we see it pretty uniform across different applications that if you look for the case of predicting char electron charge densities or looking at different um, equivariant models on the tasks of molecular dynamics, you really do see an, a, a, a much more steep curve once you turn on equivariance. And whether or not you just need kind of vector representations or higher order representations, um, it kind of depends on the task. We see a little bit, you know, better performance for electron densities, understandably, when we turn on to a greater Lmax. Even in Equiformer, we're finding that the performance does get better as we go to higher order representations. Um, so this is still, I think, ongoing. I don't know if we have like a kind of a tight knit theory of, of why this is, but this is a trend we're definitely seeing. Question? So just, I mean, the previous slide is kind of intuitive, right? because, because you were saying even for invariant properties, you actually would do better. It seems like it, it shouldn't matter. So, so do you think it's the architectural aspects or differences between them, like, like higher order tensors being used that actually makes a difference? Because it, I mean, it, 
in principle, right, if, if the property you're predicting is invariant, yeah. equivariance shouldn't give you anything extra, right? I mean, there's nothing there that's, that's encoding it. There's nothing encoded in the equivariant model that, that the invariant property is making use of, right? So it's certainly the case where if you put, like, if you have an invariant model and you have the right invariants, then it should be possible to learn it with an invariant model. But that, that requires that you basically take any dot products, uh, any sort of tensor contractions that you need beforehand before you pass it to an invariant model. So what an equivariant model allows you to do is you can develop whatever um, tensor expressions you need that are ultimately going to contract down to an invariant. Um, but you have many more ways of doing that. So it gives you a lot of added flexibility. But if, you, if you're just using an invariant model, then you better make sure that you didn't need that dot product or you didn't need that cross product uh, somewhere earlier on because once you, once you plug into an invariant model, like you're only computing invariants. I think the interpretation is that um, even if the total property is invariant, like the energy, for example, the interactions that generated the invariant property, actually the local interactions are actually equivariant, right? That's right. There are forces, right, that ro locally rotate. And, and so the tensor contraction is actually a much better way to capture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's certainly more paths. Can, can I turn that and maybe into a kind of a question format? Oh, I mean, is it, does it make sense to call? Sorry, there, no, there's no, two other questions over here before, but I, I'm, I'm happy to hear yours as well. So Alex said what I was about to okay, say. Okay, was that to say what you said? Okay. You still have invariant, interact, uh, like invariant properties that result from uh, equivariant interactions. Right, exactly. How do you think this plot would look for a model that doesn't respect invariance or equivariance? I don't know. Yeah, I just put this. Like if you had like contrastive learning or something like that. I don't know. And, and part, part of the reason why we don't have this is that for graph neural networks, we always have to parameterize our convolution. And at that point, one of the easiest ways to parameterize it was to set a basis functions, and you'd probably use spherical harmonics. Now, you can do that and then not preserve symmetry by how you like multiply things. But we haven't seen that. I would love for someone to actually do that study. So like, what about like ForceNet, for example, which my understanding at least is, you know, you have your interatomic displacements, but then you're applying arbitrary nonlinearities to that. So mm -hmm. you have the directional information, but you're not respecting any equivalent. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know how that would compare. Okay. Yeah. But uh, no, basically, I, I don't know. Yeah. And it's an important thing to figure out because I think a lot of these different training techniques can be very powerful. Um, so, you know, it, it, I think it also depends on, like, what you want from your model. I think there's space for... There, there might be reasons why you might go with one versus the other. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, it's maybe a silly point, but it just seems like the terminology of invariant model and equivariant model is not like nuanced enough to really capture the discussion. No, it's of not. We should <laughs> probably adapt some different language because yeah. like, the, the whole function is a black box is invariant, but the implementation inside, as previously pointed out, might be. Yeah. So it seems I don't know what what uh, language we should use, but it seems like it would be worth uh, maybe. Yeah, I tend to say like whether it's an equivariant interaction or not, but even that is a bit ambiguous. But yeah, because of the formal definitions of what an invariant <coughs> so and an equivariant has function to do, like, are. Internal stuff versus yeah, I typically will talk about the order of the interaction. Um, yes. Do you think the size of the descriptor influence on getting these better learning? Because as far as I understand, the keyvariant descriptor is larger than the invariant descriptors usually, right? So in this case, for these models that I'm talking about, the only thing we give them is the geometry of the system and the atom types. So that's typically what we're comparing against. Uh, now, it could be very possible that like, if you include different descriptors, maybe these numbers change. But typically, those are the kinds of comparisons that folks are making. Because uh, I feel like uh, Equivarian is giving this extra information. But it's a bit like why DimeNet is, is good, right? Because you get the, the second order terms that bond, but then also they give it an angle term. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then maybe you can increase, and it will become like force fields. The more terms you have it, the yeah. better predict. And so this is a thing for looking at ACE, so the atomic cluster expansion, which, which explicitly includes um, this uh, many body order. So basically you do more tensor products within a given layer. And so people are looking at that, and that can be very, very expressive. So still composed of the same pieces, but you, in, you, you sort of do a lot of the contractions um, before you go to the next layer. And so people are seeing some really interesting results with that. So. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm actually going to, because this is not the part I want to talk about. <laughs> I, so I'm, I'm thrilled that you guys find it interesting. I actually want to talk about these parts, but I will happily discuss these, all this stuff in great detail later. Um, okay, so very selfishly, um, 
I want to test out some explanations of kind of what makes these networks tick to you guys. So kind of talking about this natural basis that if we decide that we would like a model to be equipped with symmetry, um, what does this basis sort of look like? And hopefully this also maybe demystifies some of the descriptors that um, are also often used to describe these systems. Uh, so at a high level, you, Euclidean neural networks, so networks with Euclidean symmetry built into them, are neural networks and representation theory. Now, uh, this audience will be very familiar with neural networks, so we just have a model that has inputs and weights. We have some means of evaluating the loss, so how well is our model doing? What did we get versus what did we want? And then the important thing about neural networks is the manner in which we optimize is using gradients of the loss with respect to every parameter. Um, this will show up later in some of my later examples, so I like to always show that, okay, this is, our, this is the way that we update. Now, what about the representation theory part? So re group representation theory is the mathematics of how things change under group action. So if I apply a rotation to a vector space, what does that look like? How does that affect the vector space? Um, so if you've come across point groups, space groups, symmetry allowed, forbidden properties, you have come across group representation theory and some of its many, many consequences. Now, the co main consequence that we have, or the main constraint that an equivariant model has to satisfy, and this is the only thing it has to satisfy. So this is very broad. It's not very descriptive of, you know, really any, any um, operation that satisfies this can be used in an equivariant model, is that if I apply my group action, so if G is an element of my, my group, it's like the platonic ideal of my operation, and D of G is how do I represent that operation on my input vector space on X. So I can either act on X or I can act on the output of my function f, so I can act on y. And how I represent g on the vector space of my outputs, so y, might be different. It's going to depend on, well, what, what is the output of my model? Uh, so this is very important. So d of g is how we represent how the group acts on that vector space. And there are many, many different objects, different mathematical objects that a group can act on. So I want to talk a little bit more about that. So when we come to 3D rotation, let's just talk about 3D rotation for simplicity. Uh, when we think of acting on objects with 3D rotations, we think of, OK, there, well, there's objects that don't rotate, scalars. So there's scalars. And there's vectors, 3D vectors. But what about these more complex mathematical objects? Where do we get them from? Well, one way that you can develop these, you can actually build them up by basically taking the outer product of representations that you know. So if I know how rotations act on this vector and this vector, and in this case, I'm assuming that these are the same vector. So if I basically take the outer product, I get this new vector space, these higher order polynomials. And if I basically could do this, then I can take the rotations I know that act on this, and I can say, OK, well, these are now at my rotation look like. These are a bunch of random rotation matrices, but this is how they would look like. I can connect them directly from what the rotation matrix looked like here to how it looks like here, and it looks like this. However, one question is, I already know that scalars and vectors exist. Are there any scalars or vectors hiding inside of my new representation? Have I actually seen you know, something about this vector space before? And so what you can do is you can solve this equation. You can solve for a similarity transform. You're probably more used to seeing, like, when you do eigenvalue decomposition, like Q inverse lambda Q equals a matrix. That's because Q is square and invertible. In this case, it, not necessarily. These can have S and, and R. So if S is this vector space and R is the representation of things that I know, like scalars and vectors, I can basically ask the question, does there exist a change of basis that allows me to map parts of this vector space onto parts of this vector space. And it's actually quite straightforward to actually implement this. It's not obvious, but it's straightforward. This is going to be, I think, on homework two for the students. And what you find is that you indeed find a change of basis. And if you go from this version of the vector space to this version of the vector space, your rotations look very different. You see we have one dimension of the vector space is invariant. It's a scalar quantity. Maybe not surprising, x squared plus y squared plus z squared, the norm of a vector, is invariant. 
and then you recover that there's this five-dimensional space, which maybe doesn't look very pretty, but in fact, uh, it can't be reduced any further. And this is what we call a reducible representation because we're mixing things uh, in a more complicated manner than we need to, and this is an irreducible representation because it cannot be made further into this kind of block diagonal form. And you basically wash, rinse, repeat this, and this is a general strategy for uncovering higher order mathematical objects that groups can act on. So not too bad, you can just work with polynomials. Of course, it's not the most efficient way to do it. There are more mathematically advanced ways of uncovering irreducible representations, but this is a pretty good way for kind of getting a sense of it. And in fact, what we've recovered here is we've recovered one version of the L equals two spherical harmonic. So another goal of this problem for my class is having the students rederive the spherical harmonics from scratch. Okay, so hopefully that maybe makes these irreducible representations a, a bit more friendly. And then if you've ever heard of the term of these Klebsch-Gordon coefficients, these are the things that kind of govern our tensor products of how we turn two vector spaces back into one vector space of irreducible representations. We just derived those by solving this problem. So again, you can derive the spherical harmonics, you can derive your Klebsch-Gordon coefficients just by using some similarity transforms in linear algebra. Any questions on that before we talk about spherical harmonic projections? It's the same idea as in kernel reproducing Hilbert spaces, right? That you can generate kind of these richer representations by yeah. doing kernels and feature spaces. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the math is like, you know, same thing, just in a different context. That's uh, a silly thing. So uh, if you have something that is not necessarily equivariant or invariant, you can make it so, right, by averaging. Yes, like oftentimes you, yeah. you don't need to average very much, right? Because yeah. sometimes you only need to actually take a very small sum. Mm -hmm. uh, is that at any times used, used in your technology? Yeah, so I think, I mean, it's often like one way to, to sort of force is like, I guess they, they often say the Haar measure or, or something. You'll like take a function, you'll integrate over the group. Um, and I, so I think this is like, uh, I don't think in practice we, we algorithmically do that. I think we basically are able to derive the result. <laughs> And I understand, but I mean, you, so you never need things which are kind of almost invariant and you make them invariant or anything. That's the third part of this talk. Okay. So, because, it's a great question. you know, there are also things where um, if, if you want to, if you have a polynomial of fixed degree, yeah. in order to make it invariant, let's say, you don't actually need to integrate it. It's enough yeah. to sum it over a very small group. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I think is, yeah, it's basically what you'll do is you'll recover an invariant polynomial under that group action. Yeah, definitely. Um, but it doesn't work quite as well if you want to recover the equivariant vector spaces. It's fine, you just yeah. answer it with the opposite and then make it there. That's true, terms. that's true, yeah. And so you can generate a lot of polynomials that transform in the same way, so they map as the same irreducible representations. Great. So I wanted to talk a little bit about spherical harmonic projections um, because it's sort of the basis of how we do convolution in equivariant neural networks. Um, and also it's the basis of many descriptors. Uh, methods of like how we describe local environments. So let's say I have a local environment, I have this octahedron, and I'm gonna denote the relative distance vector from the center i to its neighbor j as r vector ij. Now, the way that I can, if I treat my points as delta functions, um, I have a very simple expression for how I would express this local environment, or at least for the moment just projecting this point onto a spherical harmonic basis. I literally evaluate a spherical harmonic at this unit vector. You can also include radial basis functions, but for this demonstration, we're just gonna forget about radii for a second. So I evaluate it, that becomes my coefficient, and I just attach it to the same spherical harmonic. And I just, the overall function of the projection is just gonna be the sum of, of these functions. And so what that actually looks like, if I go up to let's say L equals six. So I use the first 49 spherical harmonics. I'll get a function that looks like this little blob. And I can do that individually for all the other vectors. So now I have, I've successfully projected each of these delta functions onto the spherical harmonics. Let me explain a little bit about why we see something. I'm talking about spherical harmonics, functions on a sphere, and yet I'm showing you blobs. Uh, this is a, conventional way that we show signals on the sphere where the radius of the signal 
is equal to the magnitude of the signal. So if the magnitude of the single signal is zero, then the radius of that part of the sphere is zero. So we kind of tuck in the function. This is the same thing we do when we plot um, orbitals. So if you see p orbitals or d orbitals, it's the same sort of convention. So you could equally show it just on the sphere with kind of this hot spot at the pole, or you can basically say I'm going to kind of tuck in the radius of the sphere according to the magnitude of the signal at that point in space. So it's just a different way of showing it. So if I want to represent this entire environment, because of linearity, I get to just sum these up. This is just a linear vector space, and I just sum over j, and I'll get the spherical harmonic projection of the entire environment. And so why is this useful? Well, I just took a variable number of points, and I represented it with a fixed length vector. Very handy. So it doesn't matter how many points are in your local environment. If I do my spherical harmonic projection, I have a fixed length vector that is basically showing it. Uh, spherical harmonics are just also very useful because, in fact, they are a complete basis for how you describe distributions of vectors, of unit vectors. So very handy. So if we actually look at these coefficients, something that I want to point out is that, okay, so each row is one of these signals just written out in coefficient form. So there's 49 different coefficients from L equals 0 to L equals 6. And so you'll see that there's actually a lot of structure. A lot of these uh, different single point ones look similar. They're different. They're just kind of rotated. But what I want you to especially pay attention to is the fact that once we sum them up for the entire octahedra, a lot of these contributions go away. They all cancel. And this is basically the main signature of something being high symmetry, like what we really mean when we say something's high symmetry, and that we say that certain parts of the vector space are just always zero. They always cancel. And so you'll see something that looks very sparse. And at, what's nice about this is if I perturbed this local environment, I distorted it slightly, this will smoothly start gaining amplitudes in other coefficients but it's going to be smooth. It's not going to be just like suddenly I have a huge magnitude. So even when something is approximately symmetric, that still suppresses a lot of the contributions from other spherical harmonics, which is, I think, a cool fact. Uh, and it kind of, it, it sneaks up a lot in other places, but so it's just something that I think is, is good to keep in mind. All right. Um, I'm probably not going to have enough time for most of these things. But uh, another thing that I want to talk about is how do you go from spherical harmonic coefficients into invariants? Well, one thing you can do is you can keep doing tensor products and then extract out the scalars from that tensor product. So if you take these signals, that I'm going to call x, and you multiply them times themselves, you get what are called the power spectra. And what you'll notice is that all the single points have the same power spectra as they should. This is a, these are invariants. And the octahedra has a very sparse power spectra. We only have certain spherical harmonics contributing. You can go to higher order to the bispectra. Similarly, all the single points have the same bispectra. And then the octahedra has also a very sparse bispectra. And the bispectra, it just basically higher and higher moments of these distributions. More and more, um, basically, if you compute higher and higher moments, you're able to more specifically, uh, you can specify that, OK, this is the original signal that created this. Um, so, you know, you can use invariants and in equivariant models, we just can use the spherical harmonics as is. But it's often useful to know that you can derive these invariants. Um, I think I'll skip mostly through this. What I just really wanted to give something as a concrete anchor is that when we actually use these models, we give geometry and features on that geometry, and we always have to specify how do those features transform under symmetry? And so we do actually express it in terms of these irreducible representations. So you need to say it's not just a number, it's a scalar. This isn't just a number, it's the x component of a vector, because those numbers always have to transform together. This is a very important part of using equivariant models. Everything in these models are expressed, in our case, in this irreducible basis. You can choose other bases, but the fact is that they're geometric tensor objects, and that's in the inputs, the outputs, and everything in between. 
And they're very diverse objects. They show up in a lot of places, atomic orbitals uh, and so on. So um, they're very useful. All right, I think I can do this one in 10 minutes. Uh, any quick questions before I move on to the last part, which is where we talk about emergent behavior of these neural networks based on their symmetry, um, their built-in symmetry? Um, genuine question I wanted to ask now, but I think it fits more after what you said. So um, when you learn, uh, so, so let's, let's talk concretely about molecular dynamics. Sure. If you could learn on energies, mm -hmm. you could learn forces, yes. you could learn Hessians. Yes. So would you know, for example, let's let's say we can produce Hessians. Yes. It would not cost us too much. Mm. So how many Hessians would you need to, to train a force field? I don't know, but Mario and another postdoc at MIT, Shang Fu, are currently figuring this out. So they might have a better answer for you in a week or so uh, than I would be able to tell you. This is actually an, act an active question as to, um, yeah, how many would we need and how much does predicting other quantities help constrain the higher order gradients as well. In fact, in the computational chemistry community, right, some people actually fit things to Hessians directly. They just fit right. one or two minima. And yeah, but yeah. In this representation, you can actually do this Yes. Massively. Yeah, and actually with JAX, there's some really beautiful differentiation tools that make this very elegant to do. Um, so I, I don't really have an answer for you right now, but, but Mario and Shang would be able to give you a better answer. I think the understanding is Hessian to Hessian transformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be interesting. It would be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Right, thanks for the question. All right. So let's talk about some emergent behavior of these equivariant models, things that, you know, we built it to be symmetry preserving, but maybe we didn't, you know, when we built these things, we didn't necessarily understand that this might happen. So um, these networks are built to basically have the symmetry of the underlying representation. So not the symmetry of the objects you put in the system, but the symmetry of the system if nothing's in it. So the symmetries of 3D space, not the symmetry of a specific thing I would put in 3D space. However, the symmetry of what you put into the network does matter on what it can predict. Um, so essentially, the models are symmetry preserving, but there are an infinite number of things that have the same symmetry. So for example, this arrangement of points has the point group symmetry of a square, or D4H, uh, and this spherical harmonic signal has the same symmetry. They are invariant under this point group. Uh, same thing. I have an arrangement of a rectangle, and I have this spherical harmonic signal, and these both have the symmetry of D4H. So when I say the symmetry of a mathematical object, this is what I mean. So what operations leave that object invariant? And the basic idea is that in a equivariant model, you're basically trading what type of mathematical object you are going to have that has the same symmetry. So you have a lot of flexibility in how you express that object that has the same symmetry, but it still has to have the same symmetry. And this is actually a property that's, that's used a lot when making physical arguments about what properties certain materials can and can't have. And it's often called Curie's principle after Pierre Curie, who articulated in around 1894. When effects show certain asymmetry, this asymmetry must be found in the causes that gave rise to them. Basically, like asymmetric things don't just happen. Uh, they have to come from somewhere. And to give an example of this, I'm going to take Three random, randomly initialized Euclidean neural networks, they're going to predict spherical harmonic coefficients. And as input, I'm going to give them the, a point cloud, so either a tetrahedron or an octahedron, with just scalar features, saying I'm a point and I exist. And these random models, when you look at the spherical harmonic outputs, look like this. So they have the same symmetry as the input. So this has tetrahedral symmetry. Uh, this might even have octahedral symmetry because you can have even higher symmetry. That's allowed. Uh, and similarly down here, these all have octahedral symmetry. And so this is just a, f this is just a fact of the, th of the fact that it's just an equivariant model. But is this always what we want? Is this a feature or is this a bug? Are there cases where we want symmetry, but we also want to be able to predict lower symmetry outputs? So where Curie's principle isn't really holding? The answer is yes. 
Uh, one very important example in material science is that of structural phase transitions. In fact, we would love, given a prototype idealized structure, tell me how this material is going to distort. So we still want symmetry built into the model. We want to use the fact that we can recognize all these patterns, but I want a low symmetry output. Um, and let's say I want to predict this particular distortion. Now, the issue here is that going from this high symmetry structure to this low symmetry structure is not unique. There's actually six degenerate ways that you can distort into that structure. You know, ultimately, they'll be oriented differently with respect to each other, but they're, they all mean the same thing. So how would we, how would we do that? Like, ideally, we'd want to be able to predict those different examples equally, but we want to predict something with lower symmetry overall. Uh, this is an example from Rose's paper. Uh, it's a really cool paper about um, approximately equivariant neural networks for dealing with cases where um, you do have the inductive bias of symmetry, but you might have data where the dynamics are approximately symmetric. So they're not, they don't quite have the full symmetry that one might assume. Um, the way I view this is that you might have data sets, and this particular example is saying this is the dynamics for something that's symmetric, and this is the, the or heat, diffusion of something that's symmetric, and this is the heat diffusion of something that might have a slight asymmetry. But maybe your data doesn't have the information that really this object, you know, I'm telling you it's symmetric, but maybe it's actually not. Maybe because I can't observe that fact. So is there a way that I can still use an equivariant model in cases where I have an incompatibility that my inputs are higher symmetry than my outputs, but, you know, maybe whatever data source I have uh, is saying, nope, this is the inputs, this is the outputs, and you're like, oh, but this doesn't work by symmetry. We know that physics has these symmetries, so are we stuck? Uh, do we need to introduce approximate equivariance, or can we use equivariant models to solve this problem? And this is another example of basically showing um, different types of data that have different asymmetries. Again, this is from Rose's paper, and showing different models with equivariance or approximate equivariance or non-equivariance whatsoever of being able to handle tasks of you know, somewhat asymmetric dynamics. So really cool paper, so I encourage you to read it. <laughs> um, OK, so I have kind of a workflow. I think we're going to have enough time for this workflow of when can symmetry tell you something that you don't know? So when can an using an equivariant model actually allow you to uncover more information than you actually have in your data set? So sort of missing information. So let's, let's run through some scenarios. So in the case where I have my inputs x and my outputs y, uh, suppose that you know, the symmetry of my outputs and the symmetry of my inputs are compatible. So there's no lowering of symmetry of my outputs. We're good to go. Well, then we're kind of in a traditional vanilla learning scheme. If I have a single correct output, then I just do direct prediction. If there are multiple correct outputs that still satisfy the symmetry condition, then I need to have some sort of generative model that can sample a distribution and generate different examples based on their prevalence in my data set. So that's fine. But what about the case where I have a prediction that I want to train my model to be able to do that's low symmetry and my inputs are higher symmetry? OK. So if there's a single correct output, then it means by necessity, um, since we know the laws of physics are symmetric, that there's something missing. There's something you're not telling me about your system, either because you can't observe it, or maybe you didn't think it was important. Um, so how do we deal with this missing information? Then there's the case of, let's say we have multiple correct outputs, and if these are not related by symmetry, uh, we basically have the same problem as this one, but we also have uh, multiple correct outputs, and so we still need to uncover the missing information. Uh, and I'll give concrete examples for this one. And then last but not least, multiple correct outputs that they are related by symmetry. And in this case, we can do sampling, but we need non-scalars. It's very important that we use non-scalars. There's really no way out of this without it. Okay, so let's... Start with the first case, and yeah, I just wanted to emphasize here that this is important if we want to apply these networks to things where we have partial observations, noisy data, things like this. All right, so let's go with the first case. So this is one of my favorite examples um, of you know something that seems easy, seems like a neural network should do, and these networks cannot do it. I have two tasks. I would like this model to take these points and predict displacements to turn this rectangle into a square. 
And then I would like to do the opposite. I would like to take the square and deform it to this rectangle. So in one case, the symmetry is higher or high, equal or higher for the outputs. And in this case, the symmetry is lower for the outputs. And I'm going to again use the spherical harmonics to show projections of these predictions. Again, because it can show distributions of vectors and not just a single answer. So what we can see is that in the first case, the model has absolutely no problem fitting this. And in the second case, instead of getting a single lobe, we get these weird double lobes. And this is because the model, even though you only showed it this single example, it predicts degenerate outcomes. It says, well, there's two rectangles. Do you want this one or this one? Because from its perspective, you basically trained it on both, even though you only showed it one. So how, what is one way you could resolve this if you're in the situation where you're like, no, 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 I really, really, really want this rectangle, not this other one. The one way that we do this uh, in terms of phase transitions is that we use something called order parameters. So it's some sort of simple descriptor that basically takes us from our high symmetry state, and we have these lower symmetry degenerate states, and it basically tells us which way we're going to fall. So can we uncover this sort of order parameter, this missing piece of information about our system, that will tell us which way we want to go? So back when I was showing how we update the weights in a neural network, we can also do this to the inputs. And there's some really beautiful properties about the gradients of equivariant neural networks, where if the output has the symmetry of the inputs, but what you wanted to predict has a lower symmetry, your gradients have lower symmetry. And so your gradients can actually update your inputs to have non-trivial symmetry breaking uh, contributions. But it'll only break the symmetries you have to break, nothing more. It doesn't arbitrarily break things. So what you do is that you can start off with just a scalar input on these, and you'll get this answer. But then as you learn, parameters that break the symmetry between the x-axis and the y-axis, you're able to complete the task. And so these types of corrections that you can learn are very specific from a symmetry perspective. Like I'm not learning a vector, that would break too much symmetry. I don't need to di differentiate it x and minus x, I need to differentiate the x-axis and the y-axis. And so that's what we observe, that it'll only break the symmetries you need to, the minimal amount of symmetry breaking. Any question on that? So, very dumb question, actually. So why not just train a model that only is equivariant to the symmetries of y and just forget about symmetries of x? Yeah, certainly if you know that to be the case, you can. So for example, if you're like, oh, actually my entire data set uh, should just be, you know, that x and y are distinct, uh, but everything, all other symmetries are good. So you could certainly do that. This is how, if, if I don't even know what's going on, like I just see that my training curves are just not, like they're, they're flattening out some weird way. The model can actually say, did you know that these two inputs and outputs are symmetrically incompatible? And what's nice about it is that your signal can be arbitrarily complex. Like doing a symmetry analysis like is definitely doable, but if you have a very complex tensor field, and it might be not that the, you, know, you might have an order parameter not just for the whole thing, but maybe for particular parts, Maybe there's parts of your material that actually there's some defect that you don't know about that's actually having a big impact on the dynamics. So it basically allows you to use gradients to back that information out. So you could in principle start with a very symmetric model and then start breaking the symmetry for subsets of data, just to discover the symmetries basically of in your data set. Yeah, exactly. So one thing you could imagine doing is that you could train a model on a lot of simulated data and you're like, okay, I know this model is quite correct. And maybe you even train it with some perturbations of like, okay, I'm not gonna break this symmetry in a specific way and then um, freeze certain aspects of the model or train it jointly and make it such that you build a model that not only um, has the correct physics, but given certain symmetry breaking, it can actually also uh, continue to predict the correct physics. So you can like calibrate the model to like your more realistic situation that's you know, not idealized. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, so what do you mean when you say you update the inputs? Like, are you modifying your actual data in a way that they become less? You can think of them as, um, okay, so when we were talking about weights, 
and this equivariance condition, there's something that I kind of swept under the rug, and it's that all the weights in equivariant neural networks, uh, traditionally as they're implemented, are scalars. Now this you can kind of think of as, well, what if I have some non-equivariant, or, or sorry, some equivariant non-scalar weights? So, you know, it's a bit of a perspective as to am I modifying my data or am I fitting additional model parameters? Because this would be the case of if it's for an entire data set. Um, and then some of the later cases is like, how would you do this on a per example basis? Um, so what I'm describing is sort of for, you know, you're fitting an entire data set and you're uncovering these global order parameters that describe something systemic in your data. Um, but yeah, you'd be basically modifying, you'd be having additional inputs to the model besides just your scalar weights and your normal input. Thanks for the question. So this second case, I'll be quick with this one. It's just the idea like if I have my rectangle and I want, or sorry, my square and I want this rectangle or I want this parallelogram, like these are not related by symmetry. So clearly like something very different is happening to generate this versus generate that. So in that case, you may need to find, you know, there's multiple underlying parameters and maybe you want a statistical model that like 50% of the time it does this and 50% of the time it does that. So you could also accommodate um, these types of training um, tasks as well. Or, you know, let's say you have a, a vector field that is translation equivariant and then suddenly you have two different types of kind of divergences or, or things that are not translation equivariant. Um, there would be a different way of handling each of those cases. All right, so lastly, and then um, we can wrap up. I wanted to give another example where we can actually look at the math. So this is completely analogous to rectangle square, but it's for the permutation group. So suppose we have the goal that we want to partition this graph into two subgraphs and we want to use a permutation equivariant neural network. So different group, but same idea. So we either, you know, subgraph one, we're going to label as one zero and subgraph two, we're going to label as zero one. Now, if I train my model saying, okay, I want you to output this. What it's going to do is it's going to output this. It's going to basically average. So you're either like, okay, well, either my model is just really bad at learning anything, or maybe it's trying to tell me something. And in this case, yet again, what's happened is that it's averaging between an, an, another symmetrically degenerate implied output. So I can either have this be, you know, white and this black, or this black and this white, and these are equivalent answers. But how do you tell the difference between whether it's learning something silly or learning something that has greater depth to it. So what you can do is that you can try and make predictions on higher order moments of this distribution. This is the mean of the labels. This is the second moment. So you can make a prediction. You can say, okay, I'm gonna train you to make this prediction. And what it'll do is it'll learn this. And you're like, okay, well, that's interesting. However, this is still not quite useful. I can't quite sample from this because let's say I look at the eigenvector decomposition. It's not unique. This is one of the problems with, with uh, matrices and symmetries is that this will be an eigenvector and this will be an eigenvector, but they're symmetrically degenerate. So there's no way for me to know really, well, is it this orientation of the vectors or this orientation of the vectors? I can always rotate them. So it's not a unique decomposition. However, if you go to higher order tensors, you often can produce a unique decomposition. And so this is actually one way in which you can train your data set on a single example. You don't even have to know that there are degenerate outputs because as I said, for increasingly complex tensor data, it's not always obvious. Um, but if you make your outputs more robust, then you can actually identify when your model is actually predicting something degenerate and you can actually sample from it and then move on with your life. Now, this can get quite computationally expensive, so you want to be strategic about when you do this. Like if you're coarsening graphs, you might want to do this on a coarsened version of the graph, or in the case of Euclidean symmetry, you may want to use an order parameter, like a global order parameter, rather than having to deal with correlations across different objects. So there's a lot of tricks, but I think, I think there's a lot to be done here, and I, I think it'd be really interesting. Um, so with that said, I am uh, over time. So I'm gonna leave this up and I'll take any remaining questions that we have.